your guide to scallions. Also known as spring or green onions, scallions are more than just a colorful garnish. They're harvested earlier than other allium veggies and are full of amazing nutrients. Both parts of the plant can be eaten, though the white part has a slightly more intense flavor than the green. Guardsman. This variety is ready for harvesting within 60 days of planting. Nebuchan, a Japanese variety that's prized for its flavor. Redbeard. This variety has purple red stalks and is quick and easy to grow. Tokyo Long White, another flavorful perennial variety with long, slender stalks. Evergreen White Bunching, a winter-hardy bunching onion with little to no bulbs. Before you start your seeds, make sure you're planting in a spot where onions were not grown the previous year. Full sun is also needed in order for them to germinate. Direct seeding. Thinly sow your seeds a quarter inch deep in rows that are one to two feet apart. Then cover with a quarter inch of fine soil. Next, firm the soil lightly and keep it evenly moist. Seedlings typically emerge in about seven to 14 days. Then you'll want to thin your scallions to stand about two inches, five centimeters apart when seedlings are one to two inches, 2.5 to five centimeters high. Also, keep in mind that their ideal soil temperature for germination is between 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 to 25 degrees Celsius, and they prefer soil with a pH between 6.0 to 7.0. Transplants. This method is often preferred for home gardeners. Scallion plants can be sown four to eight weeks before transplanting them outdoors. When you're starting them as transplant, sow three seeds a quarter to a half inch, five millimeters to one centimeter deep in each cell of a 72 cell tray. Scallions need rich, well-draining soil in order to thrive. Since their root systems are quite shallow, they also need constant moisture and weed protection. Your soil also needs to be prepared to create a fine, smooth seed bed because you'll want to plant your seeds shallowly. As well, soil crusting should be avoided and all clods, soil clumps, must be removed or pulverized before you plant. You'll also want to keep moisture levels high in the top eight to 12 inches, 20 to 30 centimeters of your soil. Most of the bulb should form on the surface of the soil so make sure you don't transplant too deeply. Blanching. During the growing period, hill your plants with soil two or three times, a bit higher each time. This process forces the leaves to grow higher up the plant, resulting in extra long blanched stalks and a bigger edible portion. Watering. The best way to water your scallions is by ditch or furrow irrigation. This supplies water to the roots while keeping the tops dry, because if the tops get consistently wet, they become more susceptible to disease. Weeding. Make sure to keep any weeds under control during the growing season. Weeds compete with your plants for water, space, and nutrients, so control them by either cultivating often or use a mulch to prevent their seeds from germinating. Fertilizer. Fertilize monthly, preferably with a solution that's high in nitrogen. For example, fish emulsion, which is an organic fertilizer, will keep your scallions green and growing. If you're using an inorganic fertilizer, any one to two to two ratio fertilizer works well. For example, a five to 10 to 10 blend, 5% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, and 10% potassium would definitely do the trick. Add one pound of this fertilizer to every 50 square feet of scallion bed, then work it into the top six inches of soil before planting. This process makes the nutrients available to your young green onions as soon as they sprout. Mulching. Mulching is needed for the control of weed seeds and also to retain soil moisture. You can use organic materials like straw, grass clippings, or hay to mulch your scallions. Hardening off process. 
Before planting in the garden, seedlings need to be hardened off first. Gradually get young plants used to outdoor conditions by moving them to a sheltered spot outside. Keep them there for a week and be sure to protect them from the wind and hot sun at first. If there's any threat of an overnight frost, cover or bring your containers inside, then take them back out in the morning. This hardening off process toughens up your plants and reduces their risk of transplant shock and sunburn. Once they're ready, transplant your seedlings outside as a clump, typically four to eight weeks after sowing, once they're about the thickness of a pencil. Before they go in the ground, you'll want to trim their roots to one half inch and their tops to four inches in length. When you plant them, keep them spaced at six inches, 15 centimeters apart, in rows that are spaced 24 inches, 60 centimeters apart. Companion plants do's and don'ts. Do's. Plant chamomile and summer savory near your scallions to improve their flavor. Beets, brassicas, carrots, dill, kohlrabi, leeks, lettuce, strawberries, and tomatoes will all grow well alongside your scallions. Don'ts. Asparagus or peas of any kind are bad companions for scallions. Growing structure options. Raised beds. When using these, it's important to have fertile, organic, and well-drained soil in full sun. Work some organic matter into your soil at least six to eight inches, 15 to 20 centimeters deep. Remove any stones, then level and smooth the surface. Cell trays. Sow two to three seeds into individual containers, thinning to one plant per cell after germination. These cell trays allow your scallions to better develop their roots. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it, which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day, and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg laying sites and get rid of weeds, which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg laying. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier, which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth, essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Onion flies and onion maggots. They begin as larvae, maggots, in the soil over the winter. Then they will emerge as flies in the spring. Females typically lay their eggs at the base of a plant's stem, and cool, moist conditions will increase their chance of survival. The larvae will feed on the roots and stems of a plant, and the damage they cause can act as an entry point for soft rot bacteria. As well, this damage can stunt the growth of seedlings or make them wilt. If you try to pull up affected plants, often the plants will break at the soil line. Also, if an infestation happens while plants are forming bulbs, those bulbs will then be deformed and susceptible to storage rots after harvest. Here's what to do. Good sanitation is important, 
and all crop residue should be removed at the end of the season, since maggots will die without a food source. It's also important to remove any volunteer, wild onion and chive plants, as these can act as an infection source. Finally, floating row covers might provide some protection by preventing females from laying eggs around the crops. If there are noticeable symptoms from these pests, pull out all the plants and use what greens are salvageable. Then destroy the rest of the plant parts since the flies that produce onion maggots can continue to lay eggs, causing problems for future crops. As well, it's important to practice crop rotation. One last option is to place yellow sticky cards around plants to attract and trap the adult onion flies. Onion nematodes. These are microscopic worms that live in the soil. They inject a toxin into the roots that causes the plant tops to turn yellow with blackened tips. The entire plant can then become deformed. Here's what to do. Pull up any affected plants, chop off any salvageable tops, then discard the rest of the plant. Crop rotation can also help to reduce the amount of damage nematodes would have on any future crops. Slugs and snails. These slimy pests are either hard-shelled or soft, and they are nocturnal creatures who feed on the leaves and stems of a plant during the night. The feeding damage from these pests leaves irregular shaped holes behind. Leaves can also be shredded or eaten entirely. And there will also be slime trails on nearby rocks, plants, and walkways. These pests thrive in damp conditions, damage a plant's growth, and also affect a plant's ability to form roots. Here's what to do. Wet conditions encourage slugs and snails. So, although it's important to keep the soil moist, it's just as important not to overwater any plants. As well, avoid overhead watering and keep any organic waste away from plants. If possible, hand pick any slugs or snails at night, which is when those pests are most active. Beer traps are another way to handle a snail or slug problem. For this, dig a hole in the ground and place a large cup or bowl into the hole. It's best to use something with steep sides so that the slugs can't crawl back out when they're done, like a mason jar. Fill the jar about half full with beer and let it sit overnight. In the morning, the jar should then be full of drowned slugs that can then be flushed down the toilet. Another option is to place a barrier of diametaceous earth, a natural powder made up of the skeletons of tiny aquatic creatures around plants to keep snails and slugs away. Thrips. These are tiny, needle-thin insects that are black, brown, or light yellow in color. Thrips suck the juices of plants while also attacking the leaves and stems. Affected plants will have rough bumps, discolored speckles, or silvering on their leaves. Those leaves can then become distorted, twist, and fall off the plant. As well, thrips can spread many diseases from plant to plant. If the thrip infestation is severe enough, it can kill plants off entirely. Here's what to do. Lots of thrips can be repelled by sheets of aluminum foil that are spread between the rows of plants. Be sure to also remove weeds and debris from the garden bed after frost, and avoid planting next to onions, garlic, or cereals where large numbers of thrips can build up and then transfer onto other crops. Also, use reflective mulches early in the growing season to deter thrips. Spinosad and neem oil can also be used to spot treat heavily infested areas. Finally, release commercially available predators like minute pirate bugs, ladybugs, and lacewings, which are especially effective in greenhouses. For best results, Make releases of these predator bugs after first knocking down severe thrips infestations with a spray from the garden hose. Finally, watering plants from above is another effective way to prevent a thrips infestation.
damping off. This is one of the most common problems when starting plants from seed. Seedlings will emerge and appear healthy. Then suddenly they'll wilt and die for no obvious reason. Damping off is caused by a fungus that thrives in moist conditions and when soil and air temperatures are above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It can also thrive when soils have too much nitrogen fertilizer. This fungus favors slow-growing, deeply seeded plants. The stems of affected plants become water-soaked and will eventually collapse, while roots become too water-soaked and damaged to function. Older plants can also be affected, and either those older plants become stunted or they will collapse. Damping off can be spread three different ways, either in water, by contaminated soil, or on gardening equipment. Here's what to do. When possible, plant disease-free seeds. Keep seedlings moist, but avoid overwatering the seedlings to keep the soil from getting too wet and try to keep the soil from getting too cold. Raised beds are usually a great option for planting, since raised beds help with drainage. Also, avoid over-fertilizing seedlings, and thin the seedlings out to avoid overcrowding, and to make sure the seedlings are getting good air circulation. If containers are being used, those containers should be thoroughly washed in soapy water, and then rinsed in a 10% bleach solution after each use. If any plants are affected with damping off, remove them from the garden and then practice a crop rotation of two to three years. Downy mildew. This fungal disease thrives in cool, humid climates. At first, downy mildew causes leaves to turn yellow, typically starting from the main vein, then spreading outward. Fungal spores that are grayish, purple, fuzzy spots will then grow on the undersides of leaves. Downy mildew typically affects young, tender leaves, and severe infections can also cause curled and distorted leaves. Sometimes those affected leaves can then become dehydrated and then drop from the plant entirely. When seedlings are affected, their growth is stunted, and downy mildew can also reduce crop yields while acting as an entry point for other diseases. When older plants are affected, in addition to the lesions they get, they will also seem more rigid and narrow as compared to healthy plants. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice good crop rotation. Ensure good air circulation around plants and water plants early in the morning. This last tip gives the plants enough time to dry out during the day, making those plants less vulnerable to infection. Downy mildew is usually spread when leaves are wet for too long, so it also helps to avoid overhead watering. As well, be sure to keep weeds from growing. Once plants have downy mildew, the best thing to try is to eliminate moisture and humidity around the infected plants. If possible, try to improve their air circulation through selective pruning. In general, downy mildew normally clears itself up in an outdoor garden once the weather warms up, since it doesn't do well in warm temperatures. Also, if there are any infected plants, be sure to remove all crop remains after harvest to avoid reinfection, since this fungus can survive in crop residue. Keep in mind too that downy mildew is much easier to control when a plant's leaves and fruit are kept protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin two weeks before the disease normally appears and when a long period of wet weather is in store. Copper treatments can also start when the disease first appears. Then those treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as the treatments are needed. onion smut. A disease causing dark brown streaks that run up and down the leaves, which initially look like long blisters on the leaf surface. As these lesions mature, they turn brown and contain a mass of dark powdery spores that give the plant tops a sooty appearance. Diseased leaves might bend or twist abnormally, 
and those leaves are usually dropped prematurely. This fungus will stunt the overall growth of affected plants. Onion smut typically thrives in temperatures under 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and the fungus can live in the soil for several years. Here's what to do. Rotate crops and avoid planting in the same spot for at least three years. Also, encourage rapid growth of the plants with watering and fertilizer in order to get these plants safely past their vulnerable stage. Also, seeds can be treated with certain fungicides before sowing, while the seed bed can be treated with methyl bromide, a type of harmless gas. If onion smut is found on any plants, certain fungicides can be used to fight against it. Pink Root Rot A fungus that attacks the roots of a plant, causing those roots to turn from light pink to red and eventually purple-brown. Pink root rot also causes roots to shrivel and stunts the plant's growth because eventually those affected roots will die back. Infected plants will show signs of nutrient deficiencies and drought since their roots can't take up water or nutrients. Typically, this disease lives in the soil for several years and thrives in warm temperatures that are above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. Pink root rot is usually caused by soil that's been heavily wet for more than two weeks. Here's what to do. Plant disease-resistant varieties if they're available, and try to plant as early as possible so that the bulk of the plant's growth will be in cooler temperatures. As well, long crop rotations of three to six years with non-susceptible crops will help reduce this pink root rot disease but it won't get rid of it entirely. Drip watering is a good way to control plants' moisture level, while also avoiding pink rot in the process. As well, plowing and mulching the soil promotes air circulation to fight against this fungus. Finally, soil solarization can also be helpful. Simply cover the ground with a tarp in hot weather so that it traps the heat from the sun in order to kill off the disease. If pink root rot is found in the garden, be sure to remove any and all infected plants. Rust. A fungal disease, rust is mainly found on the undersides of leaves. Rust spots will first appear off-white and puffy, later becoming the red, brown, circular raised spots that are unique to rust fungi. These spots will be powdery and are often surrounded by a yellow halo. Typically, rust will cause a plant to lose its leaves. Here's what to do. Practice crop rotation by rotating with non-host crops and plant disease-resistant varieties when possible. It can also help to plant crops early in the season. Also, avoid long periods of leaf wetness when temperatures are warm, which are the perfect conditions for this virus. Be sure to also disinfect poles, trellises, or other equipment to avoid the risk of infection in the future. If crops are infected with rust, pull up the diseased plants and destroy those crops. Harvesting. Harvest your scallions as soon as they reach about five to six inches tall. The younger they are, the milder their flavor will be. Simply loosen the soil around each bulb and then pull or dig up carefully. Damaged scallions will rot quickly, so it's important to be gentle. Storage. Trim the roots off, along with any dead or damaged leaves, then wash and store your scallions in the fridge. Scallions should last about a week, but they can last longer if you wrap them in moist paper towels in a plastic bag.